This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Tug of war, Google misses, Amazon breaks its losing streak in Dow component, Visa splits four for one, potentially setting the tone for trading tomorrow after a triple digit gain today. Floodgates are open on earnings season, but things are different this time around, and it could change the way you make investment decisions. Mick Shakeup, meet the man who has a big task ahead of him, and that would be turning around the world's largest restaurant chain. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, January 29th. Good evening, everyone. Another busy day on Wall Street, the busiest day of the current earnings season. And after some upbeat corporate results, a slight gain in oil prices and good news about jobs, all the major averages end the day sharply higher. But we begin tonight with some big after-the-bell earnings reports from names like Amazon and Visa. First, a rare top and bottom line miss from Google after a surprise drop in user clicks on its online ads. The search company took in $6.88 per share after adjustments, well below the Wall Street estimate of $7.11 a share. Revenues grew 15 percent and were just shy of $18 billion. But again, that was short of forecasts. Shares of Google, one of the most widely held stocks in mutual funds, initially dipped, then moved higher after hours. Bertha Coombs covers Google from the Nasdaq exchange, and she joins us with her one big takeaway from the firm's results. Good evening, Bertha. Good evening, Sue. You know, the thing we are seeing from these big tech companies like Google is that mobile really is what matters, and you need to have engagement with people on their mobile phones, and that's where you're going to sell them advertising. Although initially lower, shares are getting a bit of a boost as the executives on the conference call seem to be saying, hey, we get it. We know they're talking about engagement on YouTube, on mobile, and how they are working on trying to get better advertiser engagement with regard to that. That is going to be the key here over the next few months. All, All right. right. Oh, sorry, uh, excuse Mike, me, Bertha. I appreciate that. Uh, stay right where you are. We're going to get your take on Amazon's results uh, in just a moment. But first, let's move to Visa. Uh, and the news here was very good for the world's largest credit and debit card issuer. It got help from lower gasoline prices, a robust job market, among other things here in the U.S. Earnings, $2.53 a share, excluding items. That top forecast by $0.04. Cents. Revenue, a slight beat there, as you see, $3.38 billion versus $3.16. And after announcing that four-for-one stock split, shares of the costliest stock in the Dow index, that's pre-split, were initially higher in late trading, as you see on that graphic. Mary Thompson now with her one big takeaway on Visa's numbers. Well, the key takeaway is that it's steady as she goes for Visa. The payments giant reporting an 11 percent increase in profits for the quarter thanks to revenue growth in all three of its business segments, service, data and international. Service is the revenue that it collects from banks for putting their name on the card. Essentially, data is the fees that it collects for processing transaction and then international are those cross-border transactions um, that it processes as well. All of these good results delivered despite the negative impacts of a stronger dollar. Total yeah. process transactions for the company in the quarter up 10 percent. That was a little less than expected because cross-border transactions weren't quite as robust as analysts had expected. The company also affirmed its earlier guidance for its outlook for 2015 and said it's splitting its stock four for one. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson in New York. Also reporting tonight, e-commerce giant Amazon, which saw a 15 percent jump in net sales last quarter, but had to uh, spend a bundle on its Amazon Prime video streaming service. A huge top line beat of 45 cents a share, excluding items, easily topping forecasts of 17 cents a share. Revenues topped $29 billion, but just missed estimates. Shares seeing an initial jump in after-hours trading. And once again, Bertha Coombs rejoins us from the NASDAQ exchange with her big takeaway from Amazon's results. Bertha? You know, Sue, Amazon is still spending, trying to keep people engaged with them, particularly through Amazon Prime. We have to think of them now a little bit like a Costco or a BJ's, where they want you to be a member to keep you in there. The good thing that they did this quarter was to show they can still make money doing that. They don't seem to have anything that's going to be a huge spender, outsize spending, coming up. So investors are, are much more encouraged that maybe some of all of this activity that seems to be so strong can flow to the bottom line now. All right, Bertha, thanks again. Appreciate it. Bertha Coombs at the NASDAQ market site. 
And let's give you a Wall Street wrap-up. Stocks shook off some of those early losses today and ended sharply higher after a round of strong earnings from consumer-related stocks. And on news that new claims for jobless benefits fell now to a 15-year low last week. At the close, the Dow was higher by 225 points. Rising oil prices helped, too. NASDAQ gaining 45, and the S&P was up 19 points. Oil did end slightly higher, but not before it dipped earlier in the session, below $44 a barrel for the first time in six years. But it did rebound late in the day. Domestic crude up $0.08 cents today. Brent higher by $0.66. Cents. It topped $49 a barrel. And as we near the halfway point in the current earnings season, we've seen a real divergence between companies with an upbeat outlook on the economy and those with a downbeat one. So where do things stand so far? Dominic Chu takes a look. Earnings season so far has been all about a battle between good news and bad news. And there's been enough of both to cast a confusing shadow over the health of corporate America and the overall economy. Today is no exception. Take luxury goods retailer Coach. Shares posted strong gains after the company reported better profits than analysts had anticipated. While certain business trends are still showing signs of weakness, some investors are encouraged by better traffic and a higher rate of visitors who actually ended up buying something. Perhaps Coach is a sign that people are willing to spend on discretionary items like handbags and shoes. Then there are things that we buy regardless of how the economy is doing, like dishwashing soap, toothpaste, and pet food. All things made by Colgate Palmolive, which was also strong in today's trading after the company said one measure of sales growth rose and that outweighed a lower profit forecast. But it wasn't all good news. Continued weakness in the price of crude oil led a number of big companies in the industry to cut their spending plans in the coming year. Among them, ConocoPhillips and Occidental Petroleum. Both companies said that they would reduce the amount of spending on exploring for and producing oil this year. We're currently around 40% of the way through large cap earnings season. And according to data from Thomson Reuters, overall S&P 500 earnings growth for the fourth quarter of last year is slated to be around a little over 5%. But top line or sales growth is only expected to be around 1%. Oil giants Chevron and ExxonMobil will both report earnings over the next couple of trading days and will give investors the latest read on just how much of a drag energy companies will be on overall corporate earnings growth. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. So if companies are reporting a mixed bag of earnings and giving weak guidance about future profits, what will drive the stock market higher or can it churn higher? Let's uh, get some thoughts from Steve Masoka. He's chief investment officer with Wedbush Equity Management. Steve, do you think the market can or will go higher this year? Uh, I think the market will be relatively range-bound this year. I see both positive and negative indicators out there affecting the market moving forward. We're coming off many years of a very hefty uh, stock market rally. Prices uh, in the market are, tend to be, if not expensive, certainly not cheap. So uh, I'm looking for the market to be rather range brown, maybe slightly higher or slightly lower, but I'm certainly not looking for the double digit percentage increases we've seen in prior years. And how much of that also has to do with the mixed earnings picture that we've seen so far this quarter? Well, a good deal. I mean, I think there are many parts of the earnings picture or corporate profitability picture in America that are mixed. If you look like the news today, Coach, a company that doesn't, isn't that reliant on international revenues, therefore doesn't have, uh, is not, susceptibility to, not susceptible to currency impact and really doesn't have anything to do with the oil patch, does well. But when you start looking at companies that are either in the oil patch or provides goods and services to the oil patch, Clearly, if not in the fourth quarter, certainly in the first and second quarter, you're going to see degradation in those income statements. You know, sometimes uh, we, we can look at the earnings and say, okay, they're coming in okay, and a lot of the companies are beating the forecast, but the guidance has been a little soft or soggy. Uh, are a lot of these companies sandbagging? Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to use the term sandbagging, but it seems, you know, Time after time, quarter after quarter, it's a recurring theme on Wall Street. The numbers come in good, the revenue numbers come in good, but management says, well, you know, the upcoming quarter could be challenging and we're going to put a range out there that maybe 
brackets, 10 or 15 percent around Wall Street estimates, maybe to the lower end of that. Mm -hmm. And then surprise, surprise, the next quarter they beat the numbers once again. So I certainly think uh, corporate America is sort of caught on to a little trick here and wants to keep Wall Street, uh, you know, happy with the actual reported number by keeping expectations down. Right. Well, how would you invest then in an environment where you think we're going to be range bound? Do you stay in the United States or do you look elsewhere around the globe for value? Well, I think you have to be concerned about currency as you looked around the globe. I think there's value in equities in both Europe and Asia, but I would be concerned about the U.S. dollar continuing to rally and about, you know, losing whatever you make in the stock market, losing that in currency. Uh, in terms of our own market, I think there's a lot of value still in the equity income space. I think there's a lot of companies out there with significant dividends that are trading at very reasonable valuations. And so even if you don't get a 10 or 15 percent move in the stock market, if you're getting paid a 4, 5 or 6 percent yield, uh, you're going to be doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. There are literally hundreds of stocks in the U.S. that yield in excess of 5 percent. There's actually over 200 stocks in the U.S. that yield in excess of 8 percent. All right, let's do and a I little. I think in those areas. I want to do a little investment okay. haiku here right now. Mm -hmm. One okay. sector, one word you would buy in the U.S., one sector you would avoid. Uh, I would buy business development companies or BDCs in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. I think they're relatively inexpensive to book and, and yield. And I would, stay, I would stay away from energy right now. It's too oh. early. Steve, thanks very much. Steve Masoka with Wedbush Equity Management. Well, one of the biggest gainers in the Dow today was McDonald's. Shares of the hamburger giant sizzling 5% higher. On news we reported last night, CEO Don Thompson will be replaced by the company's chief brand officer. So who is the incoming chief executive and what challenges does he face? Sarah Eisen has more. America's biggest restaurant chain is getting its first British CEO. Steve Easterbrook grew up in Waterford and has been with McDonald's since 1993. He took a brief hiatus to run UK-based Pizza Express and Wagamama back in 2011. Easterbrook is credited with turning around McDonald's UK business and running its European arm. Most recently, he's been the chief brand officer, focused on marketing, menu innovation, and digital initiatives. They're making their bet now on Steve Easterbrook, but it's going to take more than one person. It's going to take a whole new strategy at the top because they have lost them. They're not getting the millennials and they're losing their current customer base because the whole market's shifting into healthy foods. McDonald's is coming off its first drop in annual same-store sales in at least 10 years. The U.S. market has been particularly worrisome. Investors fear McDonald's is losing touch with its core customer and with millennials who are turning to fast casual chains like Chipotle, Shake Shack, Panera, and others. That will be the primary challenge for Easterbrook in turning around the company's performance. You can't go the route of Sears. You can't go the route of JCPenney. You have to bring it back. You can't just make minor changes. You have to make some major changes. Otherwise, the millennials won't come in. They'll go to Chipotle. They'll go to every place else, but they won't be coming to McDonald's, and they need to capture the millennials. Another challenge when it comes to the turnaround, this company is massive. 36,000 global chains, 1.9 million people working at McDonald's and its franchises. No question, it is going to take time. But investors do appear optimistic, the stock rising on the news after going absolutely nowhere over the last two and a half years during Don Thompson's tenure, at a time where the broader market rallied more than 45 percent. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sarah Eisen. Well, from news about the world's biggest burger chain to the uh, latest about one that's got a lot of people talking and was mentioned in Sarah's report, that would be Shake Shack. Its stock will be begin trading on the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow. And according to Dow Jones, the always packed purveyor of patties priced its IPO at $21 a share. That was above expectations. I'm so glad you got that read. <laughs> I really am. Still ahead, biotech stocks have been blasting off, as you probably know. But after a slew of IPOs and a number of secondaries, is the party nearing an end?
with more Americans streaming data and video to their smartphones and tablets, carriers and satellite companies are desperate for any available wireless airwaves. And just today, the FCC raised a record $45 billion by auctioning off some wireless airwaves, far surpassing expectations. Now, the winners are going to be revealed, or the winner will be revealed in coming days, but among the bidders, well, the usual suspects here, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Dish Network. A big vote in the Senate today, despite the threat of a veto from President Obama, the Republican-controlled Senate has approved a bill that authorizes final construction of the Keystone Pipeline. The vote was 62 to 36. The pipeline has been a top priority of the new Congress, but today's results are a few votes shy of the 67 needed to override a presidential veto. Also in Washington, President Obama is proposing a lot more spending in the 2016 federal budget to be released on Monday. The White House is looking for a 7 percent jump in federal spending next year, which amounts to an additional $74 billion worth. That eliminates, blows past those automatic spending cuts in the so-called sequester legislation. $561 billion would go toward defense spending and another $530 billion in non-defense spending. On to some international news and the Central Bank of Denmark, which just cut its key interest rate for the third time in, two, in the last two weeks. Now, the idea here is to weaken the value of its currency, the Danish crown, which would keep it within a tight range against the euro. And now to Russia, where that nation's finance minister is discussing the economy and how hard it's been hit by falling oil prices and Western sanctions over Russia's role in destabilizing Ukraine and its relationship with debt-ridden Greece. Jeff Cutmore has more now from Moscow. EU foreign ministers in Brussels have extended the timeline on existing sanctions. When I spoke to the Russian finance minister, he said his economy will learn to adapt. We also talked about signs of division with the new Greek government suggesting it has not signed up to these new acts against the Russians. When I asked him whether he would be willing to extend finance to the Greeks, he said they hadn't been asked yet, but it is something they would consider. We're, uh, if such a petition is submitted to um, the Russian government, we will definitely consider it. We will take into account all the factors of our bilateral relationships between Russia and Greece. So that's, that's, uh, that's all I can say. If, if it is submitted, we will consider it. The finance minister also talked about the state of the economy and how the falling oil price and economic sanctions had knocked $200 billion off the economy in 2014. I asked him about the current state of interest rates, currently 17% for this economy. He said those rates could do with coming lower now that there is less volatility surrounding the Russian ruble. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jeff Cutmore in Moscow. Shares of Alibaba have their worst day since going public, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The Chinese e-commerce giant's earnings topped estimates, but revenue missed, disappointing investors. This is the company spent more money trying to attract customers on mobile phones. The company's executive vice chairman says he still believes there is strong growth potential in mobile. We take the long view in this transition to mobile because the first thing that we focus on is user growth and user engagement. So as long as we see robust growth of monthly active users uh, going up to 265 million a month, that is a very, very large number and a net add of 48 million uh, active users uh, just in the matter of three months. In the long run, we uh, see that mobile monetization uh, is going to trend up. Shares slumped almost 9 percent to $89.81. Ford's report was similar. Its earnings topped estimates, but revenue was slightly below consensus. The automaker maintained its 2015 profit outlook, and the company also said its loss in Europe would be wider than previously thought for 2015. Still, shares were almost 3 percent higher to 1485. dollars JetBlue's profits soared in its fourth quarter as it benefited from lower fuel costs and operating expenses. The airline's revenue slightly below estimates, but investors seem to ignore that. The shares rose nearly 9 percent to 1716. 
Pulte Group's results were better than expected, easily topping the street's forecast. The home builder cited a pickup in customer traffic, new orders, closings, slight increase in average selling prices as well. Shares there popped 6%, 2182 was the close. Dow Chemical, one of the largest chemical companies in the U.S., also posted a beat. That's thanks to growth in its agricultural science business, helped largely by new crop protection products. And a stronger dollar did hurt results. Still, shares rose more than 4.5% today. They finished at 4501 Shares of Hershey melted today after the chocolate maker posted weaker than expected quarterly numbers and cut its 2015 outlook. The company blamed the stronger dollar and rising cocoa and dairy prices separately. Hershey says it plans to buy Crave Pure Foods, a beef jerky maker. So say hello to Hershey Jerky. <laughs> The stock tumbled 4% to 103.29. Biogen IDEC out with results after the closing bell. The drug maker's profit easily topped estimates while revenue was in line. That's thanks to strong demand for its multiple sclerosis drug. The company also issued a forecast above consensus. Shares initially jumped after hours before the close. They were up a fraction to 353.25. Well, Biogen IDEX strong results are just one example of the overall strength and continued growth in biotechnology companies. So what's behind the surge in biotech and what's next for the sector? Meg Terrell takes a look. Biotech's been on an incredible run. And the question everyone keeps asking is, when does it end? The Nasdaq Biotech Index has returned more than triple the S&P 500 in the last three years. 2014 set a record for initial public offerings, blowing out even the big bubble year of 2000. And this year, so far, the momentum continues. This week, 10 healthcare companies are planned to go public on the Nasdaq. Three start trading today. And last week, biotech companies raised $2.6 billion in secondary offerings, according to RBC Capital Markets. Analysts and investors say at some point, the market won't be able to absorb more deals. We've seen a, um, a plethora of deals over the last few weeks, the first couple of weeks of January. And um, it's sort of been a mixed bag. Some, some of the offerings have been successful, some haven't. And that suggests that maybe either a, a waning appetite or just a limit to the capacity of uh, biotech analysts to research companies quickly enough to make investment decisions. But we might not be at the end just yet. Biotech bulls point to a couple things driving momentum. The FDA approved 41 new drugs last year, a record number. Mergers and acquisitions have been on a tear. And technology, particularly in genetics, has vastly improved. President Obama has even invited the heads of research at several drug makers to the White House tomorrow to discuss investments planned to improve health and treat disease. There are a number of areas that, quite frankly, uh, where we have brand new cures for things we didn't have uh, before. So that, that's really fueled the excitement. So while there are questions about the end to biotech's run, optimism is still winning the day. Of 18 CEOs interviewed at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference earlier this month, only two said we're in a bubble. And all of them said they expect biotech to outperform the broader market again in 2015. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. Coming up, not even Harley Davidson is immune from the strengthening dollar. But investors seem to be focused on something else, we'll tell you. Profits at Harley-Davidson hitting the brakes last quarter, skidding 41 percent, mostly on the impact of a stronger dollar on overseas sales. Still, sales were higher and earnings top Wall Street forecasts, and shares today revved up nearly 4 percent higher. So what's next for the motorcycle maker? Morgan Brennan takes a look. For Harley-Davidson, currency headwinds will add even more pressure to sales and margins this year, overshadowing a projected increase in worldwide motorcycle shipments. But analysts say despite those FX woes, results were still better than feared. The concern was that in some of these international markets, 
uh, as the U.S. dollar appreciated uh, that uh, you would see a drop off in demand. Uh, and the good news, I, I think, coming out of today is, is we saw the opposite. Harley's been expanding beyond its core ridership, American baby boomer males, since the downturn, targeting millennials, women, African Americans, and pushing aggressively into new markets overseas. The company has been gaining ground in Europe, Latin America, and Asia, especially China and India. That's now where the lion's share of Harley's growth is coming from. International shipments now make up more than a third of the company's total, and fourth quarter retail sales increased 9% abroad versus a nearly 2% decline in the U.S., despite lower gas prices. New bike models have successfully been geared toward these new customers as well. In India, three out of four motorcycles ridden are Harley street bikes. They've been working for years uh, to expand their distribution in those markets, uh, and I think it's a, it's a key component here of, of the growth moving forward. But again, that could depend on the dollar, because a stronger greenback could make exports more expensive. Competitor Polaris Industries, which reported earlier this week, is already forecasting a slower year for that very reason. For Harley, however, that hasn't yet happened, pushing shares higher as international demand chugs along. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. Finally tonight, a look at how much we're expected to spend on this Sunday's Super Bowl. National Retail Federation uh, predicts Americans will spend a record $14 billion on the big game, about 89 bucks a person. That spending includes new HD TVs that are purchased ahead of the kickoff, chicken wings, pizzas, and an estimated 325 million gallons of beer that all of that will be consumed. Wow. All right. That does it for Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow.